Hello. We were for a second. <laughs> Is County? No, moment, then took us off again. Oh, uh, see. Yes, I'm not handing anything over here at all. Okay. I think they said a lot of good times there are problems with the film quality. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Cass from the county. We'll be uh, getting in just a short bit. So just right, 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 right. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Now. <laughs> phone on mute because I get everything and everybody else will be hear it if we're not talking. Do you think put your phone on mute? I do. Thank you. I wonder if that clicked. I'm all back in to see if that clicking goes away. I'm it as well, though it seems to be gone now, actually. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Building Use Requirements Working Group, and we will be starting out by Cassandra taking roll, and uh, this will also include our, our uh, participants on the phone. Go ahead, Kat. Okay, Alan Harris, Anira Gacha, yes. Turna, Brandon Wheeler. Here. Corinne Powell. Here. Courtney Bailey. Frida Versad. Nelson. Present. Jay Brown. Jen Cotti. Present. Tillman. Julie Carrera. Right here. <laughs> Morgan Levin, Ian Headley, Mo Marie, here. Patrick Sellers, 
Paul Hansbury. Present. Ted Buchanan. Roger Wheeler. <laughs> Ford. Yeah. Susan. And see Lee Howard. And and just all right. And uh, is there anyone on the call who I haven't announced? Can you All right, one at a time, please. Amy Keck. Keck. K E C K. Okay. Anyone on the call? Julia Caress. Yes. And we have Carmel Angelo here. Janelle here. Diane Curry here. Uh, Michael Oliphant here. Derek Pett here. And anyone else in the room? Trey Strickland. There he is. <laughs> Get right by Trey. Sorry. Anyone else? Edward. Uh, Edward. Uh, I think Gavin. That everyone? Okay, so the last meeting we had was on November 3rd, and I have asked Carol um, to kind of give a recap on where we are with the building requirements group, and then after Mike, Scott Ward, since the two of them have been working together. So go ahead, Mike. Okay, thank you. The last meeting, the building department issues we discussed. The ag exempt policy that was currently uh, being utilized and building policy number one that deals with steel containers and shipping containers and uh, changes to those two policies. And I'm happy to say that they are both live now and active. All the revisions that we had discussed at our previous meeting have uh, been approved. They are now online on the planning building website and ready to go. And uh, I have copies, or I can get copies to any of you who, who may want that. And the third item that we discussed in the last meeting towards the end of the meeting was the cascade ordinance and how that is being revised. So currently, the standing committee of the board has the revisions. They are deliberating on those and deciding what part or what part of those revisions they are going to uh, vote to approve, and then they will take it to the board and uh, take a vote from there on, on how they're going to proceed with the Class K ordinance. And uh, that's that's about it. That wraps it up. Who's on the standing committee? That would be John McGowan and Dan Lover. Except that Hamburg is not doing it anymore now. He gave that position to Chair. Yeah. yeah. For 2007, for 2018, did they change? And since Dan is chair, the county council is going to check on something. They're going to get back to the board on that. And what it is, uh, the county council is checking the legitimacy of existing structures. So the revisions that the building department is proposing are for new structures. So when you come in and you want to build a new structure such as a house or a storage shed, that's when these revisions apply. But for pre-existing structures that exist, County Council is exploring the option of letting that be under the old or <laughs> old existing Class K ordinance. You got it? Yeah, um, the county council and the standing committee are both looking into that. And yeah, I've spoken numerous times with the building official at Butte County. They are the only county that has an exception like that. The only county that I'm aware of out of all the counties that I have contact with. And piggybacking on that, wasn't there also a um, 
request by the board to find out whether or not um, exceptions or waivers or variances or something from the building code could be made in class K context so that with respect to various issues, there can be a determination as to whether or not the county is lawfully allowed to deviate at all. Um, is that your understanding? Uh, what it is, is county council is exploring uh, enforcing the current law to a lesser standard. And uh, so class K, my, uh, I'm inviting to lose the name class K, just call it what it is. It's limited rural dwelling housing out of California state law, uh, Title 25. And our current building codes are Title 24. And they're from different sections of the law. So it's my understanding that uh, we would be allowed to have the, that ordinance in effect. So you would be allowed discretion? Yes. That's my opinion. County Council is exploring that. Yes, it's, it's pretty specific in the revisions that uh, were uh, proposed, and that is under habitable structures, a minimum foundation would be required. Now, remember, this is under regarding new structures, not existing structures. Brand new structures would be required to have perimeter foundations for conditioned habitable spaces. Now, for accessory structures such as a storage shed or a shed or a barn, you can do both here if you choose. Okay, so I thought we talked about um, what's allowed and what's not allowed. So, what's allowed is taking like some engineering standards of posting here instead of like having each person getting their own engineering done. Or if they want to see posting here, having some of those standards written into the ordinance. Well, we discuss it among staff, and due to site conditions, you can imagine on every site you have different slopes, you have different types of soil and soil classifications. It's hard to come up with a boilerplate uh, pre-engineered plan like that. So we would accept on a brand new structure, post and pier, but it would have to be addressed by a design professional, such as an architect or an engineer. Yes, Colonel, I, I guess I, I either misunderstood or my family isn't very good. I understood the board to say that this had left the committee, came back to the full board, and the board gave direction to county council to seek an opinion, and the opinion would be public yeah. when the county council released that, but this was never a reassigned to to standing or an ad hoc committee at right now. This time it's under the full board right now. Am I wrong? Well, you're you're right with uh, the action that the board took to make the opinion, the legal opinion public. And we were just actually talking about it over here that we think that date is coming soon. The deadline for county council to make that opinion public. Yeah, well, I don't think there's it was approved on consent for, for her to release that opinion. Now, where and we just talked about that at our agenda. Yeah. And then they, gave, they went further to give direction to bring right. the thing back to the board. We're going to check the consent directives right now. So I'm talking to Janelle's going to look and check to see exactly what the board directed. But I hear what you're saying, that it comes back to the board. Well, they disbanded the standing it's, committee that was there anyway. Well, they cleared it from committee. Right. It was going to planning commission and then back to the board. And we're thinking after, sorry, so maybe the first meeting in February, we're anticipating something to come back. That's what I If I But the opinion we have not seen yet. Go, go ahead, Mike. Uh, I stand corrected. So it has passed standing committee. Yes. Um, we are ready to. Uh, file a draft ordinance for the board when directed by the board. Okay, so, uh, so we're checking on the directive, and uh, I don't know about the legal opinion. 
I, I want to have Scott also be coming. Quick question, Hannah? No, I'll wait until I that. Lee, anything else? So we're trying to get that in. I'll wait for you. Okay. All right. No, anything to add? Well, Happy New Year, everybody. I'd like to, again, um, thank Mike Olaf on his staff and the CEO's mm -hmm. office for all their help thus far. We've made great strides. I'm pretty proud of what we've done. A couple of little things we need to flesh out that I talked to Mike briefly about this morning. I think it's a good resolution. <laughs> and um, the Porta Potty thing, thank you, Trey. Some of our major hurdles are behind us, and now a little bit cleaning up, and some of the anomalies, some interpretations maybe in the future policies. But I don't know that we have that much more work to do from my end. But thank you for your help. Can you list the page? That, that you might have this morning that uh, a lot of people come to me about what do issues, shipping containers and um, hoop houses under a thousand square feet in engineering, they can go ahead and exempt whether or not mechanical or electrical can be in them as with a permitted greenhouse. The exempt policy is written that electric mechanical installations are prohibited from being attached, attached to the house structure. The bill codes provide exemptions for insulation, such as decorative lighting, which you guys use for vegetation, <coughs> um, connected box fans, connected window air conditioners are all exempt from building permits. If installed in a hoop house but not attached to the hoop house, I have my understanding, and it should be, that um, the building department doesn't have any issue with it because they're exempt for permits in the first place and they're not attached. One way to facilitate the lights not being attached is to use your light depth frame structure and run the lights between there along with the cable. And then your compliance with the code. String lights affixed with an extension cord do not require permits. If you want to put a box fan on a sawhorse to beat out of your hoop house and plugged in, it doesn't need a building permit. If you plug the outside receptacle, that receptacle has to be GFI and that outside receptacle needs a permit. But decorative lighting, but for connected appliances do not need permits. Therefore, they cannot be prohibited in hoop houses as long as they are not attached. Okay. Is what the power source is that you're attaching your independent appliance to? Any electrical source that you're plugging in with a receptacle requires a building permit, whether it's solar or a vestry utility like PG&E. You still need a permit for the solar that produces the power, the batteries, the inverter, and the wiring to that outlet. That all has to be the code. That's all electrical code. That all requires permits. Small generator. Small generator. The If you plug in a small generator, a generator requires a permit. We need to that it's grounded, and then it's in a safe location. Or outside. So for any size or just size of the above a certain. You're talking about those little Honda Whisper Watts? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've never seen a, if you're speaking about a Honda 2000, I've never seen one of those permitted because they're so, they're so small. How about a three or a seven? Well, I think if it's powering your permanent power for your permanent structure, then yes, associate that with your permit. You can take that. All they're going to look for is level level ground, ground the frame. Yeah. And um, we can put the outlet's already in the generator. And run the plug. It's not that big of a deal. That it's vented properly. I'm going to move on to the other issue with shipping containers, which I still I appreciate the work and the policy, but it's for residential storage. The question that I have, and any residential storage shipping container modified needs to find <coughs> residential storage. That's what the policy says. For an exam. Build less than 1,000 square feet do not need engineering. Can a shipping container be exempt? They're less than 1,000 square feet. And can one cut holes in that shipping container to mount a window and air conditioner? That's the question. Can someone get electrical permit to run electrical? It was less than 1,000 square feet and you permitted as ag exempt. That's why the ag exempt policy number 13 was written this way that all structures over 1,000 square feet must have uh, engineering. So if you get a, so my for the argument again, if I want to, if I do an 8 by 40 shipping containers and I wanted to make them dry sheds, boardrooms, I could go egg exempt with them, modify them with an electrical or mechanical permit, but I would not need to have the, mod, the shipping container itself engineered because it's less than 1,000 square feet. Up to 100 amps. Mechanical is prohibited. The plug cord air conditioner is not. 
mean, you run outlets in there to run your lights. And so it's not where you can only get the electrical permit and the egg exam permit without the container architect to give you a, mod a plan for the modification of the shipping container. You're correct on the structure being a less than a thousand square feet. That's correct. That's number 13. I don't want to set precedence to all of a sudden allow a lot of mechanical equipment apparatus attached to it. No, no, and it's, it's prohibited in the egg exempt ordinance. Yeah. It's prohibited. That's wanna... prohibited and also processing is prohibited. Trimming is prohibited as well. But if a guy wanted to run a grow lights in an 8 by 40 container, okay. you could do that up as long as a max 100 amp service. That's correct. If you wanted to ventilate that, you could ventilate it with an appliance that's exempt from permits, such as a box fan or window air conditioner. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Hannah, I have a couple of um, questions um, getting back, and thank you, Scott, for um, enunciating what the main issues are, and it sounds like those are kind of a consensus of what's what, so maybe they're not issues anymore. I want to go back for a moment to the ag exempt policy in general, and I, I was checking the website, checking the website, and there's two separate issues that I'd like to address. One is just a hyper-technical, maybe your webmaster issue. Uh, it comes at least as of yesterday when I was checking. We go to the building and planning website. The hoop house determination thing is still before you would get to the forms and handouts, which then deal with ag exempt. And the only thing that is listed in the ag exempt is the actual permit, like the application. And so I don't know if that's been updated. I haven't looked today. I haven't had time. But it would be really helpful to not confuse people with the hoop house determination on the first page, and even, or maybe just have a, say, a thing saying hoop houses now are possibly permitted under ag exempt. Because people are confused about all these different things any, anyway. You guys know this stuff inside and out, and we've certainly learned a lot about it. But I think that the average user going into the system would get marvelously confused. So I don't know if there's a way to just kind of look at it as if you haven't, you don't know the stuff inside and out and see if you can find information if that makes sense. The other question that I would ask, so and also if it's possible, if it's already there, to size the application itself to have the actual policy on the page? Is it there already? I'm sorry. No, we can. You guys are all, we can have these changes done in five minutes. That's great. Thank, Thank you so much. I can and speak to Adrian about yeah, that. Yeah, we can. Okay. Done. I miss a weird time. If you, if you go through here, though, yeah. it's all here. I, I totally appreciate that, but because yeah, people yeah. wouldn't necessarily understand if they see application, you know what I'm, I'm just saying from a, a somebody who's entering the system, if we could have policy labeled and then the policy listed, application labeled, and also there is a weird thing when you print it that it's weird, as you know, the size is different. It's eight half by 14. Yeah, so if you might want to note that to people that when they print it. Anyway, um, those are just logistical things, but I'm wondering if Mike, if, at the, uh, not, I, I keep wanting to say the last board meeting, I wasn't there last Tuesday, so it was one right before Christmas. Um, staff mentioned that, uh, <laughs> Ashton said that staff is just doing final tweaks. And again, I haven't had the benefit of going on, online today to see the actual final. Were there any changes in between? Oh, no, it was, they were all the red lines. Um, red line documents, so we cleaned up all the red lines and reformatted it, but it wasn't any. Right. As far as substance, so Mike and I have about four keys exactly the same. Perfect. That's great. Thank you so much for answering that. Then the next um, question that I have um, is a slightly different topic, and, and again, I just want to stop and thank you both so much for the hard work that you've done, and it's just so important impressive and it's so helpful. Um, we, I, I have a new topic that I would like to discuss, um, which has to do with the different treatment of building permit applications, not administrative permit, not use permits, but building permits that are for cannabis as opposed to any other 
activity, whether it's ag exempt or fully commercial. <coughs> and I really would like that to be a topic of discussion because I don't see a real basis for it. And I am gravely concerned about the disparate treatment. And I do recall that, and I don't think she's here, but Devin early on was, oh, uh, had mentioned this issue also just in general to be concerned about having equal treatment for all agricultural products, all commercial building requirements, all non-commercial, you know, just everything being equally treated. And particularly I see some very disconcerting situations where cannabis building permits are being held up unnecessarily when the identical one cannabis structure has already been approved. And one of my sub-concerns besides the disparate treatment is the safety issue. The um, public notice process of it and, and, and what happens there by labeling it cannabis is very, very disconcerting to me and it has ramifications well beyond your immediate department. Um, so I would like to talk about that and see why it is helpful in your office to do it that way, to see if we can come up with a solution that addresses both my legal concerns as well as the practical considerations and see if we can come up with something that works well for everybody. Okay. What I noticed in the age, I've filled out a couple lately, thank you for having the policy in there, and it says, an exempt application itself. <coughs> you need two applications to go egg exempt, by the way, the building permit and the egg exempt application. On the egg exempt application, what type of farming endeavor are you engaged in? I think cultivation. I'm not putting cannabis cultivation, I'm putting plant cultivation because it's true. It doesn't single anybody out and shouldn't be questioned by staff. So, it's saying that the licensure is related to that work. Correct, but publish your records so they can go to the department and get access to those and they can get access to the permits over here. You don't want to play, if you don't, if you want some semblance of an anonymity, it's impossible because you're dealing with the public and it's a public document. But you don't have to put cannabis on your building permits. You can put plant cultivation. But I'm saying that up until now, the building department has forced people to label things. And I'm not talking about ag exempt because we weren't no, dealing with that. And that's my step. They were forcing people to write in big bold letters cannabis on the file. And, and, and then they were treated differently. And I would like to have a thorough discussion about this so that I can better understand why that might be helpful from a logistical point from the building department and address whether or not we can do anything to help you people with your processes without treating things differently. And well, I just want to open this no, up. I, know, I agree it's a good subject because I have some clients, believe it or not, that aren't cannabis that came in for some class K permits under amnesty and they put cannabis amnesty on their application mm -hmm. and had to take it off. They were not, they, they, they weren't growing. They were just wanted to take advantage of the amnesty. So we have a, a section at the top of the application that says describe complete scope of work. And so it's up to the applicant to put their complete scope of work there. Um, if you want to put uh, greenhouse for uh, plant cultivation. For plant cultivation, that's fine. But I have clients who came in and you would they forced them to write cannabis when they were applying for commercial greenhouse. No, because the building department uh, went processing a building permit for a greenhouse. Uh, we're not concerned about with vegetables or cannabis. We're concerned about the safety of the structure. And, and I'm really happy to hear that, but I have many clients who called me immediately and were quite upset about this, and the staff at the counter, at least, is forcing it to be labeled as cannabis-specific. And again, I'm not, I'm not staff trying. Sure. I'm exactly. Not. I think what we can do, and I don't think we're going to belabor it here no. and have an answer, is we can just take it back to planning talk to Nash and just say, yeah. we just we train. No. I have that in my notes for our managers. Yeah. I don't think okay. it is. I don't think it was intended. And I don't think we need to change the application. I think we're okay with the yeah. application the way it is. But I will bring it to their attention. And it's not, and it's just not just the application. It's just the process that somebody's weeded out at, at the, oh, I didn't even mean that, sorry. Uh, 
permit has to serve a use. And so we do need to know what the use is. It, you don't have to say cannabis. It could be just growing plants or a structure, a single family residence, a barn, a shop. Can you use receptacles, security lights? There's all kinds of legitimate use. So we need to know, we do need to know what it serves. And so we have well use only permits that serve a well only. And so, obviously, you took out a permit that serves a well only. No, I was forced to have so, a permit so, that well only. I would have used it for plenty of other things as well. The and reason that, that came about back in the day when I was there with bell bottoms was that people were pulling towels for lights and outlets, and all of a sudden, they went there the next time, and they had a whole house book. happened on Facebook. I think his name was started with a K. Mm -hmm. so well permit and built a house around yeah, that. Yeah, that was a lot of my property. That's what you did. You told PGV you were going to power well, so you got more put. And then, you never and then in 2001, they said, no, nah, you need a building permit. Yeah. So you have, and it's, so that's why, and it's just kind of a historical fear of getting, we call it naked power back in the day. It has to have a legitimate use. A legitimate use is a security light or an outdoor house. So again, I, I think we're talking about. Uh, yeah, I think we're talking, we need to talk in generalities. I mean, and, and if that's something that you would, I would, I would sure sit down with the, and Mike and he would have to address that just to look at what it was. Um, I, in fact, there was a difference. But Lee, you had your hand up. Right on here, again, my guys, like the building contractors, the old houses, they have the same problem we do. And they want electrical from them. They're going to buy it for everything. And they, they can't get it. It's got to be specific. And the pump is the worst one of them all. It's actually relaxed over there in the last six months. All right, Scott? They we relaxed it quite a bit. For my but, charge. Yeah. Well, we have set up a 70 amp service. That's we right. will allow 100 amp service because the 70 amp panels are very difficult to get. Sorry to interrupt, Lee. No. But anyway, it, it, I just want to assure you, you're not the only one. You're not alone in your pain. <laughs> okay, I feel much better now. <laughs> okay, I have one more issue. Uh, just briefly, and that was. Um, Mike, in your update, if, if you mentioned that you're waiting for the board to direct you to write, to bring forth an ordinance, and I kind of feel like they've already directed that. And while it may be that you're waiting for a county council's final word or something, that there's this history of waiting to be told again, and then they get a little irritated, like we thought that we already told you. So I'm just wondering if that's if the recollection, as I understood it, was that, yes, please, we've been waiting for this, could you bring it to us, and not waiting for yet another board meeting for them to tell you to. But I, I, this is just my personal recollection, so if I'm wrong. So, so I will clear the record. I, I'm 100% positive that I'm not to draft the Class K ordinance because we don't know what the board is going to vote on. For instance, the, the, the H the uh, fire sprinklers in all new structures, all, all those proposed things. That's coming in February, and yeah. the board dis discusses it in February, the full board gives direction. Committee can't direct That's it. That. And then if I draft it right now, then I have to redo the whole thing That's later. Exa it's just Mike's exactly time. right. I'm, I'm just I'm, going through the actual director. Right. From, for no. yeah, so right. I right. want to be very clear on sure. it. It's just, but basically, right now isn't the Right. So what you're going to do, though, is going to present a memo of choices to them, or? It's already been done. They'll come back to the full board in February, and then the full board will give direction at that point in time, because the sprinkler, exactly, they'll have public comment, they'll invite any input, any amendments they have to the committee's recommendation, 
then I'll direct you. September 9th. We did write up February date, yes. And the, the reason I would like to say that we pushed it is that Mike could do all he wanted to do and tell, and, and you can all remember this. This was at least five months ago, maybe longer than that, that they asked County Council for a legal opinion. It never came out, as you were saying. It never came out, never came out. And now that's what we're waiting for. But tell that gives him, what good does it do for Mike to rewrite it? Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Then we're all on the same page. We are. Nicole. Got it. And as the public, when will we get to hear the outcome? You hear the outcome at the board meeting. Oh, the February board meeting. But this is the we have to make But then you get to go two cents worth again. Okay. We did to the standing committee, now we get to do it okay. to the board. Okay. Or may continue it if there's enough challenges or questions. They may have to re review it. So it's not a done deal, but we do have the opportunity to comment once we one more time. Can we get a date that the county council will come forward with the opinion? No, but I'm going to forward it to her right now, okay? Uh, all right. If we're done with the class, I'd like to raise another issue. Mike, you and I had a conversation um, last year um, about the ADA compliance and reasonable access. Um, and um, the, the um, two weeks and the 15 employees, less than 15 employees. And the issue was uh, for, an, obviously for new structures, this needs to be part of the design for a new commercial building. But for an existing building, let's say a home business, um, I didn't have the presence of mind at the time, but I wanted to ask you this. Uh, the way that the conversation ended was that, well, it's new use, and so it has to be treated as if it's a new building. Um, seems to me that in order to apply for this, because new industry, um, that you had to show that it, this was the use uh, in January of 2016, not a new use, and so it's just the interpretation. And I just wanted to run that by you because it is, you know, it's an expensive part of doing this for people that have been doing this for a very long time. If they, it, the, the, the land has had that use, and they've had to prove that they've had that use, so it would be an existing use, it's just becoming codified or legitimized. Well, first of all, uh, existing employees requirements comes from Title I of the Department of Justice law. So uh, point number two, if you have a business with no employees, you don't have to provide access for anything. Uh, point number three, if it's an existing business um, that was never permitted in the first place for that use, you still need a change of use permit for the right use classification. But why are they then asking for you to prove that it was, uh, this was the use from January of 2016? Well, before then. Two different processes. Yeah, it's two different processes. The building department recognizes uh, a legitimate use on a building once it has a permit for that use. Along the same lines, so let's say you're, you don't have employees, but you do have a building to greenhouse. Um, would you have to worry about handicap access in that case? There's no disabled access required. Okay, so you can, even with the commercial permit. Service. That's correct. Okay. If you have even one worker, then you can no longer use just the ag exempt building for the processing and for you can't process any. That, that's correct. For, for, how about for you can't put yourself, but you can dry an ag exempt yourself. That's okay. correct. Without employees and no public access. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this processing allowed by owners is under the home occupancy. The single allowed by owners is past home occupancy, like making staff your constraints. Home occupancy is part of the planning ordinance that's been there for a long, long time. Um, it's not in the ag exempt policy. So, so not ag exempt, but like in in a home, like. So I know processing is only allowed in a commercial building, but if, uh, if you don't have employees, are you allowed to do it in your home just yourself? Uh, it's, it's possible, depending on the level of extraction, if that's what you're talking about. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, scissors with little bits of meat yeah, hanging off. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> Cottage industry. That's possible. It's possible that fits into the home occupancy industries from in the planning board. It's home occupation, it's not home occupancy. Isn't it home occupation, not home occupancy? And that will not be in the class K ordinance if it doesn't fit. And so, for the F1 occupancy building that's required for trimming, um, what, is there a certain zoning restriction for those buildings? Like, could someone with add zoning or upland residential build? As far as zoning, we would have, we would need to ask a planner that question on the per zoning for that F1. Mm -hmm. um, also, Sue, we are talking a little bit before. The sprinkler issue, um, is that going to be on greenhouses as well? Are they been speaking of that? Or no. just the incense? No. no. And, and you're probably actually requiring that for habitable, so no. habitable residences. Residents. New, uh, new, new habitable residents. So fire, fire sprinklers are not required in, in greenhouses, which are U occupancy. Fire sprinklers are required in an F1 occupancy, which is a factory type for your trimming, you know, your tracking mm -hmm. or whatever. Only if they're larger than 12,000 square feet. I doubt that anyone in this county is <coughs> building an extraction trimming building over 12,000 square feet. But if you're going to build, like, and if you want to build, if the zoning was right, you want to build a little trim room. You guys might an architect or engineer because it's an F1 occupancy. You can go get a tough shed with a set of stamp plans. And we move on. Sure, it's got a set of stamp plans. Just, you just have to say that it's an F1 and put it on concrete, and you would have a compliant F1 occupancy. Providing you need setbacks and distance of the buildings, property lines, and all of that. But yeah, it's not as onerous as it appears. The MP is the most onerous part of it. But you're saying that if you wanted process with just scissors in your leaves in your house and you have no employees, it would work under the home occupation or cottage okay. industry in our code somewhere on the website or because that's a planning ordinance and I work in the division, I would like to say let's ask a okay. that question if it fits into the plan that planning ordinance. That would be a great question to get involved. Your training is still out there. Prohibited here and it's prohibited there, but where is it? Yeah. Maybe. In the process of talking fine plant materials, in other words, in the nursery, at one point in the process of taking clones or doing tissue culture, is that just an ag operation? Yes. I think it would be best to look at our uh, adopted cannabis ordinance and look at the definition of processing. And Diane would know. Yes, Here it is. part of the Thing, what you're talking about. No. It's just an act. Right. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I would recommend that people look at both the cottage industry chapter 20.160, which is for cottage industry. That's the zoning code, not the building code. And 8.160 is cottage industries. And I'm sorry, I didn't bring with me the home occupations, uh, what section that is. It's 185. There you go. 2185, um, and point 185. And, and just understand that home occupations are very limited. Cottage industries are a little bit less limited. That's the general thing. I think where people get misguided uh, or, or, or get confused and understandably is that Answering the building question doesn't always answer the zoning question, and answering the zoning question, which is the use, the type of use, doesn't always mean that you are doing it in the correct building. And, and that's where if we can have some proactive educational tools on the building and planning website that could marry those two together some kind of user-friendly form, I can kind of muddle along and with a lot of questions, a, a lot of, of, of effort for me to do it, and I think the average person who's trying to get this information doesn't quite understand the distinction between building code requirements versus land use requirements, and then 
how are they supposed to navigate it? And I, I know that staff is so busy that they can't always take the time to answer all of those questions. And so I'm wondering if there's any way to develop some materials that might at least cut down on some of the confusion and give people some kind of a matrix or some kind of a, if you want to do this, you need to look at this and this. Or if you want to do this, you also have to consider that. Or you can't do this in this version of that. And I know that you don't want to put you can or can't on a website, but at least directions of where they need to look for the requirements or something. Because on their own, they're not going to be able to sift through those issues. And because staff is often separated between the building people and the planning people, that somebody even walking in can't necessarily get the questions answered all at once either. So I just wonder if there's any way to. If I could muddy the water just a little bit more, there's, there's your home occupation, your cottage industry, and then the thing called a micro business. Uh, yeah, that's okay. a problem. So if someone wanted to apply for a micro business license, this would include everything but uh, testing. So there would be manufacturing, there would be uh, cultivation, there would be retail. retail. Either you could have in, in your application, you could say that there's there would be no public access. And that would be a consideration. Right? Uh, you could say that you have no one. That would be another consideration. But would are, is uh, micro business being forced into one in the, their home occupation or cottage industry, or is that being allowed? So I can answer your micro business uh, question, but that just goes to show us how varied everything is. There are just a myriad of options here. So to address that on our website would just be overwhelming. But we are all here planning a building for a call or an email away. The issue I see, because it is convoluted, the three basic businesses you can have out of your residence, and the fact that trimming is a primary component of cannabis cultivation, it has to be addressed soon. Or when I tell my clients because it's not addressed and it's such a gray area, don't ask the question, do what you've got to do. <laughs> All right? Don't put the case, you know, kind of truth police. But if you truly, you guys want to keep asking this question and get an answer, because I guarantee at harvest time, Mike and his boys aren't up at your greenhouse seeing if you're trimming in your garage. They're not. They're never going to do that unless they get a complaint. If you really want an answer to the question, then this county and staff is going to have to put some resources to it to definitively think, can I have a home occupation kind of trim or not? Can I have a cottage industry kind of trim or not? Can I have a micro business kind of trim or not? Can I trim or not in my egg bar? Can I trim or not? Do I have to spend engineering or can I trim with my buddies in my garage? Those questions have to be asked and answered before the beginning of the next season, which is in two months. Trimming needs to get that resolved pretty soon here or stop asking the question, which is my advice. Well, I think, I, and I appreciate that, Scott, but the only problem is, is that in the next 120 days or less, he'd have to submit their regular state application packets and they uh, require very specific site plans which detail what you're going to do in what location for what purpose and et cetera, et cetera. So while I don't expect that there's going to be necessarily a matching up at all levels, I think that we don't want to set people up. While I appreciate the very practical answer, we don't want to set people up for not being able to satisfy requirements at the state level. And, and so I guess I'm voting for, yeah, let's, let's try and figure. And I think one of the things maybe we're seeing is that building requirements working group maybe needs to marry itself with a planning department's working group or perhaps land land use land use. and building requirements because I think that either in isolation can't answer all the questions and, and Mike Sullivan has done a, a heroic job of trying to field all of our questions and yet there's stuff that's beyond the beyond his domain. Um, bring that the wheel, Hannah. There's got to be other planning departments in the great United States to this this issue. Well, so, I have a question about that. Okay, wait. Sorry, somebody on the phone. Go ahead. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, this is the Carrera. And, um, I, Mike 
And, uh, Scott, thank you so much for your hard work. I mean, really, it, both of you have been poets. My question lies in regards to what, what Scott and Hannah are talking about. With their, uh, so the 120 square foot uh, structures that don't require permits that have any electrical or anything like that, but where are we at with regards to how those are utilized for drains or for trimming? Well, the building code has always been very specific on that. That comes out of Section 105.1, and it says that storage structures less than 120 square feet or sheds used, uh, less than 120 square feet are uh, used for storage purposes only. Playhouses. Playhouses and similar structures with utilities such as plumbing, electrical, mechanical are exempt from permit. So uh, <coughs> processing trimming fit in that particular structure. That's what it's for. Did you get that, Julia? Well, a lot of people talking, I heard, Mike, that you said that the use for trimming and those kinds of structures or anything other than storage or, or children playing uh, is prohibited in those structures. Am I correct in that? According to, according to the California Building Code, Section 105.1, yes, but that doesn't okay. mean you can get a permit for a structure similar to that for an F1 occupancy. Do that. Okay, great. What you want to do. Okay, thank you. I think one of the things that, that might be confusing to the, the general populace also is that we, like we're asking the wrong question, but it's still called the Department of Building and Planning. So we figured that, you know, you are the same department. But they know each other. Yeah. Well, yes, I can. I'll answer all the building code questions I can, but I, I'm hesitant to delve into the planning issues. Mm -hmm. We could give you a wrong answer. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I, I understand. But, the, but the, I'm saying that if people say it's the Department of Building and Planning, they figure that that's the place to go to for that. So could the multiple planners give you wrong answers, too. Um, yeah. No, no, stop. <laughs> this is a question for building. Um, when you guys determine the cost of the permit, it's based on evaluation of how much the structure is going to be, I believe. So when you're saying square feet, like the house, and maybe the ag exempt structures for drying purposes, where are you guys getting your valuation? Who's going out and doing the field work to determine the value of the cost to build these structures? And then based on that, the permit cost. We have a fee schedule that's set, and it's based on the building code standards fee schedule. And so it's built into our process. Uh, it's there. That's the way all building departments do it. Scott? Yeah, the International Code Council puts out a building data sheet every three years that gives you the basic cost of construction based on different regions of the United States. It actually breaks California down in two, uh, three regions, Southern California, Bay Area, and Northern California. Um, what I had done previously was if somebody brought me in a contractor's estimate that includes materials and labor, then lower than what the fee schedule said, I would accept that, but I would put that document in the person's file. I don't know if you guys do that here. We don't because we don't do that here. We do that for remodels, but not on new square footage. So if you're going to build a new greenhouse or a new structure, all based on square footage. If you're going to remodel a building, then it's based on job cost, labor, and materials. So my question for that is you guys are doing $9 a square foot for a storage building, or you occupancy, I believe. 13. 13 bucks a square foot. Uh, it's what, a 50 hoop house? Materials are about a thousand, and two guys can put it together in two days at twenty-five dollars an hour. That's another eight hundred bucks. It the most is three thousand bucks for a hoop house. Literally true. So you're so the, and that's uh, three dollars a square foot, not thirteen. So that makes it and the staff puts into doing the plan check and the inspection. Um, it seems like the smaller projects like that were cheap. Uh, the shipping came is two grand. Delivered maybe a thousand bucks. You got another three thousand dollars for shipping container. To give someone three times of what it costs to provide that product, I'm that hard to defend if I was on the other side of the counter. 
Well, let's let's back up and, and look. First of all, the, the hoop house isn't a storage structure, and you're right that is it's, it's, that is nine dollars a square foot. A storage structure is thirteen. The hoop house is nine. I think that was that's hard. just to assess the valuation of the structure. That's just to give us a valuation of that structure. But your fees are based on that. You're, it's nine times more than it should be. It's based on the International Code Council and the building code standards that the building department. And change that. We can't deviate from that as a county and go, look, this is hoop house. It's made out of plastic and PVC pipe that we can all get at Friedman's or Home Depot for. Well, and we can put it up and we can, ourselves. Yeah, and we can put it up ourselves. That's the beauty of the hoop house was that it was an affordable option instead of doing a greenhouse. Well, that's, that's Scott. Part of putting the hoop house is in the ag policy lower fee as well because okay. the ag building uh, permits are less than any the other permits. Okay. We have ag policy and it lowers the And I will just say if you do if we're doing anything in terms of lowering fees or taking all this money, you have to change it. So you would have to change it because what you're going to change yeah. any and, type and of amend, evaluation. Yeah. And amend the building code. What I did in Hillsburg was mm -hmm. I had people low buying they come into this house cost me two hundred grand. I want a half a million dollar house. I'm permit fees are all my staff's gonna be doing this much work on a half a million dollar house. So I amended it to say it is as per the building data sheet or contractor's estimate. I'm gonna put them on the hook. And if you got some business contractor doing a low ball, then shame on them. It doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> what if you're just what if you're just dropping your ship you think? So we have the same problem as you do with this problem and it's really starting to show itself. Twelve hundred dollars a square foot is uh, up in Fountain Grove the other day for a single family dwelling. And next door is looking at three hundred and fifty dollars a square foot. Um, it's gonna go up. We have a problem with it too, but again it's all the way back to, to the building code to have a change. I'm not saying that these are exorbitant. I may not because staff does spend a lot of time on it. Um, Angus Sands has a little lower fee standard because there's less time. It's like checking an inspection. Yeah. I, I guess what you said, this only comes up every three years, but there were a number of people that called the building and saying and said, are the fees going up? Well, the fees didn't go up, the fee gets went up because I would have pulled from it last year had I known, I didn't know the right question. I thought that if I asked if the fees going up, that would cover it, but it wasn't the fee schedule. So a lot of us have found that, oh wow, now we've got a higher fee schedule. And if there's any changes ever made to planning and building fees, that would expect effect 60 days after its adoption. And they have to do a study, they have to do a cost justification study to do a fee schedule. Evaluation is in effect for 60 days? Yeah, so they adopt a fee schedule, so normal fees are 30 days after adoption. Planning 60 days after adoption. So 30 days now. So if they adopt it, it's 60 days after. So the planning fees kick in after a normal fee. So they, but what about building? I believe it's the same for them too. Because there's different noticing requirements for planning and building and they take effect in different time. So if you, fee adopted, the fee is 30 days. So if you apply for now building, you've got until the end of this month to still have last year's fee schedule? If your permit is The current fee existing fee schedule. fee schedule, yes. And it will tell you the date it goes into effect on the fee schedule uh -huh. line. The we don't want to short them on fees, we need more staff. <laughs> so to, kind of, to bring this back around uh, to where we are, I think, uh, Mike, I want to thank you for recapping about everything that you've contributed. I have one more question. Sure. And I've heard the various uses, that's what have been approved, but is it still that Bolton to store anything pertaining to cannabis production in a container. That would be an ag exempt. You but, could apply for that. Yes. It, it's been, I've seen it described as you can't store cannabis, for example. So it is that true? The sense ordinance doesn't say that. No. Uh, no, I have the, the cargo container policy right here. I, I don't see that in here. Good. So we can store product. Yes. Well, as egg exempt, not residential shipping. Yeah, container. Right. Sorry, just two separate exempt. things. Two separate policies that Mike has brought forth. Residential containers, one that's containers able to be in the egg exempt category. So storage. If you okay. It's egg storage with an egg exempt permit. And and this gets back to my original point about uh, Mike, you know this stuff inside and out and I happen to know and I thought it was building policy number three years ago. Anyway, um 
that, you know, you know the difference between the cargo container policy for residential purposes as building policy number one or three or whatever it is, where the average person who's now entering this world really doesn't understand that it's two separate things that you have to look at. Is it your personal cargo container storage or not? If it's not, it doesn't mean, oh, you can't do it. It means you have to look at would it qualify as an ag exempt? And if that not, then would you have to get it commercially permitted? And again, all those various criteria. If there's any way on the website to give, I know that you've made it very clear, as much as you have put in public meetings and whatnot, that that's kind of the avenue that you go through. If there's any way that we can get the website to let people know that, but, that, but, but you're referencing one thing, Hannah. I, I, I got to advocate for the department. You're one person asking one question. There's probably 50 others that we could use as an example. It would be impossible. It would literally be impossible to give, for example, if you're doing this, then that. I'm not going to cite that. 500. I'm not saying that. Can we do 20 FAQs? And, and we could do FAQs for we sure. Could definitely do FAQs. And I just want to give. Sure some realistic expectations. So we have multiple working groups going on. We're processing building permits for cannabis. We're processing applications for cannabis. We're processing business licenses. We want to know as much as we can. We also have to figure out which things can we write now and which one is like the top priority of getting it done. I appreciate that and I guess what I'm trying to say yeah. is that if the public is educated a little bit more out on the website, then they might use less staff time up if they have some guidance and all I'm saying is I, I can navigate this stuff. I really can. I don't need to call and ask questions, but I can navigate it, but the average person cannot. And all I'm suggesting is that I'm trying to make things more efficient, use less staff time, so that the more we can do up front, and again, I appreciate what you're saying about not giving an example. I totally get that. <clears throat> Please remember to look here. Please remember to look there or frequently ask questions, whatever. You can probably add more information, or if you have frequently asked questions, you can give it to the department and that we can, can work on it. That can be one of our tasks. Yeah. 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 Very much yeah. that. We would get it from you. That would be great. We're not the ones yeah. asking the questions. Why don't you send them to me? But it's better to get it. Let me I'll wordsmith them into a list of frequently asked questions. I'll do what I think the group answer is based upon what I know the staff, then you guys can correct. Perfect. And Perfect. if we can actually finalize that, then we'll just stick it up on the list? Yes, yeah. that would be great. Perfect. That's Perfect. all my, my yeah. trying it's to make things more efficient. Because people may come up with and, or come to the website and they see this checklist of like, you have to meet these specific standards before going any forward with it, then they'll be like, oh, I can't do that, or, well, it's going to cost me this, and I'm done, you know? And then that just, like, stops the process right there for people. And there's probably 20, 25 questions. That are easy. Yes. We can do uh, it's policy and interpretation, but I'd be glad to do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> two hours this morning on fire damage, guys. Got a lot of irons and fire besides that. So let me bring it back around. Yes, yeah, like we don't have a complete picture here. A lot of the questions that we are asking um, certainly is the building and planning rather. And so uh, we don't have planning at the table. So thank you for uh, answering and attempting to answer all the questions. And the big issues with this group has, has been class K and all things class K. And I think now that will be handled by the board. So. Uh, is it time for us to uh, write a letter, basically closing out this committee, and a letter to the board? And, uh, when we get state requirements, then we get more back to the public to send a letter. And this one, is it time that we send a letter to the board and maybe close out this committee? You know, it, it, there were times that there were three different groups talking about class K. We were talking about it in here, they were talking about it in the standing committee, they were talking about it at the board level. So, you know, maybe at this point in time we've made enough progress and we're moving forward. But so, um, I'm not certain. Okay, and that's absolutely fine. I'm just not certain what else we can do today. Well, besides the FAQs, I think that there was the question of whether or not there are um, issues that need both planning and building, such as the trimming issue. And maybe not that has nothing to do with class K, maybe it does overlap with class K, but I think <coughs> that's a discrete issue that should be dealt with by this group. That's just my opinion. I think the primary issues 
uh, trimming. The more questions on the website to educate or educate the people to cope with it. And the land use issues that Paul speaks of we still have not been resolved. And they really do. That's another component. A lot of people don't know small businesses, you know, some do. So I think it's the land use issues that need to be resolved cleanly and precisely because I also have micro business on my cottage industry or like this. It's pretty hard to serve you as the planners. And I think you work on trim, work on trim in what zone is trimming allowed for and and let's get this home lot thing straight here. Because one of the major differences between a, a home occupation and a cottage industry <clears throat> is that uh, the cottage industry, I believe the language says that it allows for certain uses that are not uh, typical for that zoning. For instance, um, you could have manufacturing on an ag piece as a cottage industry. Um, so now as a micro business, you, you're having all these different Things they're on a smaller scale, a much smaller scale. It's not a, a, a huge factory, but and, you know it's a, it's a home business or or a, bit, or a small business at best. So just kind of in your wheelhouse, you've been you can talk with you can talk with planners. Could you be the one to put maybe ten pieces together that, that cover everything you need to know for the next meeting? We can do a planner at this meeting. You see what I can put together? Yeah. Great. So maybe we can report out to the board and then that we handle the ag exec and the build, building policy three. So we can show them what we've completed, and then the next recap is FAQ, home off slash cottage, and trimming. We'll, we'll see. We'll work with the planning side and get a planner for. Yep. So, so there, there are three. There's the home occupation, cottage industry, and micro business. Yeah, they're all together, but like. Figure that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm but I've got I'm running out of time to attend these meetings. I'm pretty swamped in my personal and professional life. And as well, you got you growing season right around the corner. So it'd be nice to wrap this up. And Carmel needs some extra time as does Mike. Those these ladies. So I think at this point, um, follow up is I'm good with doing a report out to the board. On those two items that yeah. are mentioned as concerning the Angel Hotline. Then on Tuesday, I left after 11.30, but then I watched it on YouTube, and I never saw the board say that they approved it, the portable toilet. That was a consent calendar, it and they approved the previous meeting. Yeah. It's good to know. Oh, but it was on the agenda. They adopted it. Consent. Okay. I just was they waiting. Don't, they, they don't, don't actually say it. it. Yeah, they don't talk to me. It's it's not all enough. Oh, I was like, where is it? Where is it? Yeah. <laughs> and it's a two-step process. You get some wipe, and then they bring it back for adoption. Okay. 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 And I know that Chuck had made some suggestions that I may not have discussed, but I'm not really clear. So, I might have some extent, I'm not clear if this new suggestion is a very good issue. I think it's probably more one on one. We can discuss that if you'd like, one on one. Okay, so we'll go. Energy code. Those are our guidelines. So I think that maybe talking about the ag uh, ordinance yeah, exactly. uh, building requirements. Well, the building is important. That's great. Mm -hmm. We can talk after. Okay, so I think at this point, okay, okay. Okay. why don't we go ahead and go into day? We'll do a report out to the board. Uh, I think the bigger thing, yeah, I think the biggest thing though is the last issue that we've been coming back here. So, land use issues, meaning the home occupation, the cottage industry, and the micro business, as well as coming back with some kind of work product guarding. Um, That's in Q. Yeah. And trimming. Trimming, trimming, trimming. You've got to resolve it. So the yeah, three trimming. biggest issues. So <laughs> Hannah, are you asking about next yeah. meeting? Yeah, I and 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 um, if any subcommittee <laughs> could be done in the meantime, that way we're using everybody's time efficiently. <laughs> 
is a a useful yeah, process. Uh, so, yeah, this so is an unpopular I subject, I know, but well, it's still it's relevant to many of us. And I think that the county is going to come to the next year. Somewhere along the line between the, uh, uh, the citizens' approval of Prop 64 and code issues being interpreted, some have decided that micro businesses are only appropriate in industrial zones, and that is not in 64 uh, information at all. In fact, it's 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 in the news if you ask the right people that Chair McGowan's interpretation is correct, which was that the micro business license is similar to the uh, artisan, wine makers, beer makers, that sort of thing. And they are not all required to be in industrial zones. So somebody internal to the county has made that independent decision. And I think it needs to be reviewed because I believe it's wrong. I just will say we are working on my business and we're not just issuing it industrial and we're working on trying to figure out how we're going to review all different types so every micro business is different with a different combination in a different zone with a different primary use. So we're trying to figure out how we're going to review it because every application for micro business is different with a different combination. And so that is a struggle. And I think when we come back and talk about micro businesses here with the planner and building, we can hand that out and figure out a way to process it. Thank you. Yes, and we want to also want to make sure the micro business is allowable for medical, not just adult use. We do. That's how I went there, they told me you couldn't. Exactly. What happens maybe internal to your group doesn't always get that I've not heard that you're being more uh, flexible than just industrial as it originally configured. Right now we're trying to look at micro businesses and what's your combination, what's your primary use, looking at your application and what you're actually saying you're doing and so the applications don't really have much information on what activities are they really doing. So the more information you provide of what are your businesses and what you're really doing can help them. It is a, a learning curve on the micro businesses, but we are perfectly working on it. We haven't figured out the perfect way to process them. Does that mean that if I were to apply for all our micro business licenses, that you would accept that and review it? It all comes down to your zone, where you're located, what parts of a micro business, because you can have all four, you can have three, you can do different combos. So literally, every application we get for a micro business is completely different. So your answer is yes, if I apply on my LR zone, you will accept that. I would say you need to go, you need to go talk to the planning and building, because I don't know what your micro business looks like or what you want to try to do. So I would start with him. No, you would start with the planner. Planning. planning. Final question. Go ahead, Clay. And then this is probably a question for Diane. If indeed we find that, for example, a cottage industry or a micro business is possible for us, is there a problem of changing the type of permit that we have applied for because previous they were not available? Yeah, because change the review and the criteria. Well, so then what do we do well, in the, that case? At the state level, we notified twice because you have to get your cultivation permit. Right. And the CDSA will the check and make sure you're in compliance with your cultivation site, and the Bureau will do the other things. So essentially, if you're a cultivator and you're doing both on the same site, you've got to show them two documents. You show the Bureau the still license and you show the CDSA your Agricultural permission. The permission is included in my uh, Yeah, actually, no, you, you, you just. Okay. So, yeah. When you go to the you're going to have to show them a cultivation permit and a business license. Mm -hmm. So, from, from here. From here, from. right. So, if I had qualified and I could have gotten a biz, uh, micro business uh, license or permit from the county when they're available, then am I still being considered a cultivator at this point, everybody else. Can I clarify this, and, and, and but I really want to get back to Carmel's timing. I can clarify this out. I'm another one at three. Okay, all right. So, so, so scheduling, um, do we want to go ahead and come back together as this group? Do we want to wait and see what what would you prefer? We want to keep going when Frank asks questions and everything else. Yeah, I think last case kind of out of the same. Yeah, do we want to 
just have to send something out or do you want to just go ahead? We said we'd do a regular, we would do a the uh, team scheduling, let's say, you know, first Thursday of every month or whatever. Do we want to try and do something like that? Yes. yes. Okay. So maybe we could actually do the first Thursday of every month. So that's Groundhog Day? No, that's, oh, that's Friday, sorry. First. Thank you, Scott. Hey, Scott. I, I, I say yes, that would be a wonderful first Thursday of every month. The first, first. March. Okay. All right. Um, I'll just keep this time frame. First Thursday of every month, 1.30 to 3. Does that sound okay? Perfect. Thank you. And Kat will send that information out. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.